Welcome to Locally Sourced. I'm today's host, Carol Paterno, and today we have Stephanie Rogers with us. She's written a book called The Horse I Belong To. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you very much for having me. Why don't we start off by you telling us a little bit about how you began and where you come from. I was born in New York City a long, long time ago. I have always loved horses. Uh, they seemed about as realistic for me to aspire to as walking on the moon. But uh, I got a rocking horse when I was four. Uh, I rode it vigorously in front of the westerns on television as my mother ironed. And uh, as I grew up, I would use my babysitting money to ride a horse in every vacant lot riding stable in the five boroughs. Um, I should also say, I was born to a family who wanted me and who loved me. But I had some difficulties growing up. Um, I lost my father fairly early. Uh, my mother had very clear ideas about how things should be done. And mm -hmm. um, I grew up being a very uncertain and unhappy kid. Uh, and as I got older, I, I developed a number of problems having to do with uh, substances. Um, and uh, they plagued me for quite a long time. Oh, it sounds like a story many, many of us have gone through, if not ourselves, but in our families. It's difficult. Can I ask how old you were when your dad died? I, I was 16. That is young. That is young. Um, and you had ridden horses, taking lessons. No, no. Um, my dad put me on a horse in Coney Island when I was four, and it was all over. I loved horses. I never had a lesson until seven years ago. Wow. <laughs> I just rode. And, um, well, I, when Dad died, I... I kind of didn't want to be who I was. So I went into theater, mm -hmm. because in theater you get to be all kinds of people. I worked in it for a number of years. And um, like most actors, I really didn't make a lot of money. And, and I had to sort of sublimate my love for horses. But I got to be 30. I was going to lose all my college credits. The theater could obviously live without me. I decided to see if I couldn't live without the theater. I got a full-time job in a financial institution. Uh -huh. I went to school at night. I got a degree in finance, and I started working on Wall Street. When I made some money, I started taking horse holidays all over the world. The first was the, uh, what was it called? It was called the Cordon Bleu ride oh. in Ireland. We stayed in the Ballycormick House. The lady of the house was actually a lady and a cordon bleu chef, cordon bleu, pardon me, and her husband was ex-British military, so he had retired at a very young age. They started this horse riding business, and I rode 180 miles around Loch Derg wow. on a magnificent Irish hunter, coming back to the house every night and having this fabulous dinner. Then the next ride I went on was in Morocco, and now this, this is a horse lover's absolute fantasy. I rode a purebred Arabian stallion across <laughs> the Western Sahara and through the Atlas Mountains, camping out every night. Hidalgo. <laughs> well, <laughs> sort something of. like that. <laughs> so really, Musk, Musk was his name. You were able to really have dreams come true in having horses sometimes in your life, but was that enough for you? It had to be. I just didn't see, you know, how I could have any more. But then in 2005, something happened. I mean, I'd, I'd always figured someday I'll have a life with horses. Someday. In 2005, my mother died rather oh. precipitously over a weekend, oh, in wow. fact. Wow. And I realized that the number of some days I had remaining was finite. I was very unhappy in my job. I was very unhappy in a relationship. I was in therapy. 
I was on psychotropic medications to control depression and mm -hmm. anxiety. I smoked, I drank, I did other behaviors. Medicated in many ways. In many ways. As many as my 20 hour a day job would allow. Working on Wall Street in those days was brutal. Remember the 80s, the yeah, 90s? LBOs, <laughs> remember? Oh man. KKR, yeah. Thomas Thole, these guys. Uh, I was in the middle of that. But um, I had learned from my experience in the theater that what you think a thing will be like is not always what it's like. <laughs> yes, yes. I thought a life in the theater would be wonderful, working with ideas, beloved of millions. It didn't work out that way. So I wanted to see if there was a way I could find out what a life with horses would be like before I actually jumped off the cliff. Yeah. And there was a trainer whose publication I'd been reading for many years, John Lyons yes, and I, Perfect Horse. Yes. He is in the line of the Dorrances, Ray Hunt, Buck Browneman now is a, a name. And explain what that is. Some of our viewers may not know what that line is. What is their basis of working with horses? For the 7,000 years or so that horses have been domesticated, the prevailing point of view about how to manage them is to control them through pain, fear, and force. Mm -hmm. Which is a great pity because I don't think there's any animal on earth who has contributed more to human civilization than the horse. Yeah. There's a phrase, the road to human civilization is paved with the bones of horses. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until like 150 years ago that information could travel faster than the speed of a running horse. Yeah. And I don't think there's any other animal in our experience who's been more abused, misunderstood. And through the ages, if we read back even to Xenophon, is that his name, the Greeks, people have brought to humanity's attention that there is another way. Yes. But it never has seemed to hang on. So these men you just mentioned, Dorrance and mm -hmm. Lyons, they brought it to the fore again. That is exactly and, right. And in they what are way? The, they are the modern uh, founders of something that's now referred to as natural horsemanship, yeah. Yeah. which uses the horse's natural behavior, natural psychology, to interact with them. In effect, you become a member of the herd, and you become the dominant member of the herd, the horse works with you through cooperation, not through fear and not through pain. Yeah. You know, and they say uh, of a dancer, would a dancer leap higher for someone he loves <laughs> or for someone he fears? And yeah. The answer is obvious. That's, that's a point. And I was entranced by this point of view. I'd never thought of it. You know, I, I get on these hack horses at uh, at, uh, in Brooklyn, in Queens, and you get your hour, and you yahoo, and, and you never thought about it from the horse's point of view. Mm. But Tom, it opens the mind to a whole new way of being with another being. And not just that. We'll get into this later when we talk about my book, but I discovered living in the mind of a horse is living in a healthy place. Mm especially in contrast to where I had been living before I met this horse. Well, w how about we wait a moment before we get to that horse, because if I understand your story correctly, <laughs> as you were saying, you found a trainer who believed in listening to the horse and trying to learn, and not trying, but speaking their language, yes. so communication was happening. So can I a assume you were taking lessons with this person while still working on Wall Street? Um, I took my vacation time, and instead of going to Wyoming, which is what I would do, I took a program. Mm. This particular trainer, he was a John Lyon certified trainer. Uh, he had a partner. And they offered a nine-week professional horse trainers program. Ah. And I enrolled in it. And I spent 9, 10, 11 hours a day, five days a week, in the dust, in the sun. I'd work with seven or eight or nine horses. It was three modules, groundwork, 
where you take a horse who may never have been touched up mm. to the first bridling and saddling. Second module is beginning under saddle, where you start to teach movement, guiding, giving, and then there's advanced under saddle, where you went to more advanced maneuvers like uh, leads and uh, rollbacks and lateral movement. I know most of our audience doesn't know what these things are, <laughs> but if you read my book, you will, you will. And I loved it. I loved it. So tell us about the first horse. After <laughs> taking this course, I'm assuming you bought, found your first horse. Yeah, I, um, I had borrowed a friend's horse, and the horse really wasn't appropriate for the module that we were in. So he said, go get that, that uh, sorrel horse down there. You can use him. Poker Joe. This was one sad looking horse. I mean, he, to me, he was obviously the bottom of the totem pole. But I started working with him and I discovered a kind of joy. I learned. I, I used too much. I used too little. This didn't work. I had to try that. And this poor old, he wasn't old, he was only about eight, bedraggled horse. He was like, oh, okay. He's, is this what you want? Or, uh, is this is this what you want? And I discovered the grammar mm. of communicating with a horse, and I fell in love with him. And I thought, gosh, you know, you know, this would be a good horse for me. And how I long? Said, well, horse for me? Really? Uh, I'm going to buy this horse. And. I spoke to the guy who ran the program. He thought it was a good idea. I'd worked with the horse for five weeks. He was a wonderfully trained horse at this point. Negotiated with the people. I made two payments. I mean, he didn't cost a lot. He didn't cost as much as your average month's rent in Manhattan. And I was the proudest person in the world. You would have thought he was Trigger. And uh, as soon as I paid the final money on him, I was never able to ride him again. Oh. And I don't mean to cut you off, but we only have a half an hour. All right. So from that horse, you moved on to a second horse? Yeah. I found a way to retire Poker Joe. This time, I wasn't messing around. I got a nice paper, a little quarter horse. You could rope off of him. He was a great little horse, fast, well broke, go off the legs, stop off the seat. So everything worked perfectly. Except he put me in the hospital. Oh, my. Twice. So, twice. And you kept riding? Well, my friends at the barn pulled me over. They knew I wanted to be a horseman if it killed me. They didn't want that to happen. And they pointed out with this horse I might succeed. So then you moved on to another horse. Well, I sold that horse to a guy who works at Belmont. So Nifty ah, is now a track pony at Belmont. Good for him. And I went looking for another horse. And somebody saw an ad in a tack shop, and I, I went to the tack shop. I saw the ad. I spoke to the And there was a woman there who actually had ridden the horse. She said, oh, you don't want this horse. She's a project. Head in the air, crappy attitude. You don't want this horse. Well, I went up. I looked at her. And this was not a happy horse. You know, she's looking at me with those eyes. It's like, oh, God, what new hell is this? Mm. I don't know why we brought her to the barn, because I really didn't think I'd ever be able to ride a horse again. Well, I understand we have a video of you reading the intro to your book, and we'd like to share it. Can you tell us a little bit of a setup for this? Uh, sure. Um, we tend to think about things the way we're used to thinking about them. We used to think that, uh, you know, it was appropriate to hold people with dark skin as slaves. We used to think it was appropriate to buy and sell women. We think that any animal that isn't human is somehow less. It's an animal. We don't even call ourselves animals. Hmm. My experience with this horse is we have so much to learn from them, and they have so much to offer us. There is a path to enlightenment that they can take us on. Wow. Wow. And so... so um, why don't we uh, listen to the introduction? The horse 
I belong to. Introduction. Two damaged creatures, scarred inside and out by their early encounters with humans. Two damaged creatures, anxious, withdrawn, suspicious, but keeping one tiny part of their heart secure, protected, in the frail hope that someday they would meet the one they could let in, the one they could trust, the one who would understand them, love them, cherish them. Two damaged creatures against all odds encountered each other and in each other found the one they needed. And these two damaged creatures, after a lifetime of distress, began to heal each other. One of them was an abandoned mayor called Cheyenne. The other one was me. It is a human tendency to extract ourselves from the continuity of life on this planet to the extent that we even refer to non-humans as animals, as if we weren't one ourselves. This way of thinking has allowed us to exploit them, consume them, and dismiss them as partners or teachers because, of course, what can a mere animal have to teach that holiest of holy us? Well, quite a lot, I discovered. All animals, I suspect, but horses for sure exist in a state of awareness that every wisdom tradition on earth urges us to strive for. Presence, the here and now, undistracted by our commercialism and our toys, they see the world, hear it, smell it, participate in it with a fullness humans seek and only achieve with attentive pursuit. To live in the mind of a horse is to live in a healthy place, in an unperturbed state, meaning one in which humans have not abused or perverted them. Horses live in the moment, hold no grudges, learn their lessons, and move on. Horses are honest. They do not feel sorry for themselves, fret over their appearance, worry about growing older. They simply cope. Leadership is earned, and while it may be challenged, it is respected. They are forgiving. This is the prescription for an enlightened life, no matter what your species. Their senses are so much more developed than ours that an industry has arisen around using their hyper-awareness to help physicians and psychologists diagnose and treat mental, emotional, and behavioral imbalances among humans, because the horse immediately sees what it might take the human months to uncover. Anyone who rides is familiar with this. The horse knows as soon as they see you how well you can ride and treat you accordingly. Horses are also effective in treating problems like cerebral palsy, ADHD, dementia, autism, and a range of other disorders that continues to expand. Beyond the gifts of strength and mobility, the motion of the horse communicates to the equivalent muscles and nerves of the human, stimulating them even when the human cannot. But even more remarkable is what a horse can do for the heart. It is a truism that there is something about the outside of a horse that is good for the inside of a human. I've seen for myself the transformation that occurs when a child is taken from a wheelchair, put on a horse, and a kid who couldn't walk instantly becomes bigger, stronger, and faster than anyone else. And of course, there is my own personal transformation. As I started living with horses, I made some great discoveries. For example, it is always better to reach for something you love than to run from something you hate. My life with Shy led to a continuum of growth fueled by a new worldview. I was introduced to the horse way of seeing things, totally different from the negative, defeatist, self pitying gestalt in which I had lived my entire life. I discovered the power of gratitude to lift you above the petty frustrations with the quotidian. The sense of peace you feel 
when you have trust in another. The rewards of having someone in your life to love and care for. The excitement of growing an ability, feeling and understanding something you didn't before. The most important thing this horse did for me, something that no one else had been able to do, was to make me think differently about me. That is how she changed my world. When you believe you are worthless, stupid, ugly, unlovable, you will live in a world that confirms those beliefs. I know this for a fact, because that is where I lived until she came into my life. When this horse began to trust me, respect me, when she started coming to me, when she saw me, even though she knew she was going to work, she began to make me feel differently about me. As I saw her efforts to meet more demanding requests, as I saw her responses change from fearful to purposeful, she rewrote the book of me. I felt valued, worthy, accepted. And when a thousand pounds of breathing bone and muscle believe in you, it is powerful medicine. She took me out of that toxic world of criticism and self-judgment that always found me lacking and brought me into a world of balance and motion, poetry and music, awareness, presence, softness, gratitude, and after a lifetime of not even believing in it, joy. This is our story, but not all of it. We have gone on to achieve remarkable things. And while the healing is not yet finished, this was its beginning. It did not happen for me with the psychologists, the therapists, the medication, or even the other horses I'd known. It took this particular horse, this ordinary, extraordinary horse, the horse I belong to. You did great things, you and Shai. <laughs> Tell us about them. Well, the greatest thing she did for me is not what you see here. She gave me a place to be. She gave me trust. Because she respected me, I began to respect me. Mm. Um, I like to say that any time you get on a horse, you become more than human. It is, for me, transcendent. And this was a transcendent horse. And there's nothing truer than that statement. There's something about the outside of a horse that is good for the inside of a human. And I hope someday we'll have a chance to get into that a little more, because it's quite remarkable. It sounds like there was quite a lot of healing going on between the two of you. I don't know who healed who, but I think we loved each other. and. The other day I ran into someone who saw a show. It was wonderful. She said, it didn't look like you were riding. It looked like you were dancing. Oh, that's yeah. so special. That's exactly how it felt. And you were able to do some horse shows with her? I was able to do seven horse shows with her. And uh -huh. um, we wound up being brand champion in our division in 2015. And what type of showing did you do? Western Pleasure. So there are the basic five events. Um, and trail, trail was the one we couldn't be beat. And in fact, this year I've begun judging trail courses. And, and what's involved in trail? What do they have you do? Trail is a series of obstacles that have to be surmounted exactly and precisely. So it really is like a dance. Wow. And you really have to be listening to each other, the horse on you. but you feeling what the horse is saying underneath you, I would assume. Absolutely. I mean, you can't miss a... St you have to be ensemble. <laughs> well, it's very, very special. This has been a really special time. Thank you so much for being here, Stephanie. We really have enjoyed learning about you, your horses, your life, and your book. Oh. Thank you so much for joining us all on Locally Sourced. Hope to see you again. So long. <laughs>